I'm using a handheld tonight in case I have a coughing fit, you won't have to listen to it. So that's why we're using this tonight. So um, it's been a long time. We, you know, I really haven't been with you teaching since December 10th. So uh, I don't know about you, but I almost forgot what we're studying. I had to go back through and, and reread the whole thing to know what we were studying. Um, by the way, since we were gone pretty much right after Christmas with the team, Happy New Year to you. I haven't really seen many of you since the New Year, so Happy New Year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just really cool that um, we do get together, even though the times are interrupted to, to worship the Lord and to study His Word. And, you know, as I was preparing, I, I got a little frustrated in my flesh, I'll be honest with you, because it's been so long since we've been able to study and... Uh, you know, there, a lot of things conspire against us. We had a lot of months last year where we had five Sundays in a month, so everything was still kind of broken up. And then, you know, we had holidays, and then, you know, it's like we're, we can't ever get through this book. And I know most of you are thinking, well, if you didn't talk so much, you know, we could maybe get through this book. But hey, you know, that's kind of the way I'm wired. So I do apologize for that. But the really cool thing about all this is where we ended up tonight because we talk about New Year's and one of the things we we kind of do during New Year's is we tend to make New Year's resolutions right we said well these are the things I want to change in myself this year and it, it just is really funny because there is no way I could have scheduled this but in tonight, in our studies, we're in Nehemiah 10, chapter 10. So we are in Nehemiah, in case you forgot that, because I almost forgot what book we were studying. And we are in chapter 10 in Nehemiah. And in chapter 10 of Nehemiah, as we will see, there's a pretty big radical change going on in the people of Israel. So I've uh, simply entitled tonight's study, Resolution. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. So why don't we go ahead and pray, and then we'll get, get busy in our study tonight. Father God, you, you are good. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you for, for the abundance of love, mercy, and grace you've showered upon us, Lord. Lord, that you've given us such a wonderful house to come and worship you in and Lord that you give our lives meaning and purpose that it's only because of you Jesus that that we really have a reason to be here and it's because of you that you give us give us things to do in this life Lord God and I just pray tonight Lord that all we do especially as we look at this new year Lord God would serve to bring you glory Jesus that everything we do in our, our hearts and our souls and our minds, that foremost, we will think of what you would have us do, Lord. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to fall mightily on this place tonight, Lord God. Lord, that you would uh, cover any uh, errors that I may have in what I say, that, you, that the people's ears would hear only what you want heard tonight, Lord God. And we just lift this evening to you. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. A little closer? Okay. All right, so Nehemiah chapter 10. I don't know where that is in your Bible, but it's page 406 in mine. Or you could just open your app, like, sir. On the seals of the name, on the seals are the names of Nehemiah, the governor, the son of Halakiah, Zedekiah, Sariah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Peshur, Amariah, Malkajai, Hattush, Shebaniah, Melhum, Haram, Maratham. Should I keep reading? Yeah? <laughs> we, we all know, right? We've, we've been through Nehemiah now for a while. We know that names and people are very precious and important to our Lord, right? So 
we're going to jump ahead a little bit in the interest of, of being able to get this study done tonight. So we're going to jump up to verse 28, okay? So jumping up to verse 28, and in it we read um, verse 28, the rest of the people. So after this big long of names, list of names, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge or understanding. Now you may or may not remember the last time we studied Nehemiah, the people of, of Israel had gathered together and we read of their wonderful prayer that they, they uh, publicly confessed to God. Their prayer confessed all their sins, the sins of their ancestors, and it revealed in their, in their prayer that they realized through their prayer how just and merciful and gracious God has been to them. So um, they realized that all the trials they had been through as a nation were a direct result of all their sins, and the fact that they had repeatedly turned their backs on the Lord, but yet at every time they turned around, they realized that God was there to forgive them. And the result of this realization, you know, there's a saying that says, he who is forgiven much loves much. And they had been forgiven so much that we're seeing this outpouring of love towards God now. And as a result, they have this heartfelt repentance and this leads to a transformation that's just really amazing. So, as we read about all these names, like, who are these people? Who are all these people? Well, to put it in a nutshell, they are the people of Israel, God's children, that have repented. They've realized their brokenness and that they need, Lord, the, they need God in their lives, so they've repented. So that's who we're reading of tonight. So let's read on what they said. It says in verse 29 that we join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of our Lord, our Lord, in his rules, in his statutes. Wow. That's pretty big. So let me ask you a question. Did, did anybody make a New Year's resolution this year? Victor did. One person did. Anybody else? There's one back there. Good. Ooh, Kostya did. Hey, yeah, I'm kind of surprised more people haven't entered into New Year's resolutions. I'll be honest with you, I didn't do one either. If you didn't make a New Year's resolution this year, and that's most of you, how come you didn't? You knew it was going to be broken, right? That's kind of how I feel about it. It's like, okay, I could say I'm going to make this resolution, but I'm probably not going to stick to it, right? We all have these great intentions. I'm going to, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to eat less, and I'm going to, I'm going to get in shape, or I'm going to do something else, and. You know, you, you make these resolutions, and the next thing you know, you're walking by that bakery, and that, that counter looks really good, and you're going, ooh, that's a beautiful pastry. And, and, and your resolution, your resolve, has kind of disappeared. So let me ask you another question, especially those of you that did not make a resolution this year. Have you ever written that resolution down and signed your name to it before the Lord your God, that you would stick to that resolution. <laughs> I never have. I'll be honest with you. I haven't done that, okay? But that's really what we see the Jews doing here. They resolved to make a covenant, a binding contract with the Lord their God. So... They knew that they had failed in the past, and they thought that the way to go ahead in the future is to just write this down before God and, and sign their name to it. They're saying, look, we, we know this, but we're going to make this resolution with you. And I think this is a good thing for us as people. Here's an example for you, okay? How many of you have ever entered into a contract with a lender to borrow money for a home or a car. Anyone? 
I have, right? So what happens when you enter into these contracts? You have pages and pages of documents to sign, don't you? And you have to initial here and sign here and, you know, and they have pages and pages of small print. And what does all that small print say? Basically says they can come take your firstborn child from you if you fail to, to, to make your part of this provision of this contract, right? They're going to come take away what you swore that you were going to sell to them. So you entered in to a covenant with an institution to borrow the money so that you would repay it. It was a covenant. You made a resolution that you would borrow this money and then faithfully pay it back. It's the same kind of thing we're reading about here. You know, it was a big deal to sign those documents, right? Especially for if it was for a mortgage, a home loan. That was a lot of money. And you signed your name saying, yes, I will repay this. You became legally liable for that contract. And that's the same thing that we're seeing here in the book of Nehemiah. The people of Israel repented. And they said, how are we going to go forward? They said, we resolve, we will make this contract with our God. We swear before you that we will do these things. So, they're specifying the types of behaviors that they're going to change. They're saying, we will no longer do some things. And not only on the negative, but they say, we will on the positive side do some things that we have not been doing. And we swear on our oath before you. So what's the application for us in this? What can we learn from this? And as I was studying this, I personally became very convicted because I think the real application of this is that I personally have never really entered into a formal covenant with the Lord my God, with Jesus. There have been times where I've been struggling with sins and I ask the Lord to help me with those sins and I pray and do all those things, but I never, never really sat down to take the time and say, Lord, I really want to stop this sin and I'm going to write it down before you that I will do everything in my power to resist doing this sin anymore. And then I know that you will be faithful in blessing that. I've never sat down and signed anything like that. You know, there's other examples of groups of men that, I forget what the name of that, that program is, but there are groups of people having struggles in marriages and one of, the th one of the authors, a Christian author, came up with this, that a person would sign like this 30-day pledge of what they do to try to win their spouse back. By putting it in writing, I don't know what it is for us, but when we put something in writing and we sign our names to it, it seems to really impact us much more. And I think that's really the application we see here with the people tonight, is that you know, if I, I kind of think that if all of us made a New Year's resolution and wrote it down and said, we pledge to do this in front of you, Lord God, we'd probably be able to resist that pastry counter a lot more than if we just said, oh, this is my resolution, you know. It just carries a weight. So it's just an interesting thing there. Nehemiah and the people realized this, and I think the Lord God put this in the Bible for us, so we would realize this about ourselves, that a lot of times we need something concrete from that. So what are some of the things that they, they resolved to do, the covenant that they made with the people? Well, they swore before God and they wrote it down. So look at verse 30. What did they write? We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the lands or take their daughters for our sons. Wow. Bam. They started with some pretty heavy stuff, didn't they? Right off the bat. Now, who are the peoples of the land? The people of the lands are the pagan. That's the people of the lands. This is, we will not give our daughters or take their daughters for our sons. Why? Why is this a big deal? What is this? This is a pledge by them to separate themselves from their idolatrous ways. 
This is not a thing. This is not a racist thing. They are not saying that, oh, we're Israel. We're God's chosen people, so we're better than the other people, and that's why we don't marry into them. No, what they're saying is we will not have our children marry people with different gods than we have. That's the big thing here. Now, how is this? Why is this a big deal? Well, in the ancient Near East, and I think the team that just came back from India can probably share this with you, all right, there were many, many gods. And it only made sense that if, if you were going to have your daughter marry that person's son, that you'd come to an agreement that, oh yeah, well, well you know, we, in, our, in our house we have a shrine to Baal. Well, we've got Molech in our house. Well, great. We're going to have in, and when in their house they'll have Baal and Molech. Okay? Because, hey, what happens if you fall out of favor with Baal? Well, you still got Molech in your bag, right? How many of you that went to India saw houses with all the different pictures of the gods on there, right? They may have had a, a prominent one that was there more, but they had many, many gods. This is what's going on here. But Nehemiah's God, who, oh, by the way, is our God, what is he? He says he's a jealous God, doesn't he? And what does he mean by that? He's not a jealous God in that he's a petty God. He's a jealous God in that when he wants us and his children here in Nehemiah and us as his children, adopted children in Christ, we are to be his and only his and holy is. Our heart, soul, mind, all our strength is how we're to worship our God. And so... For us as Christians, and the same with Nehemiah's people, we can't be marrying outside of the faith. The marriage, for those of you that aren't married yet, and have only seen how your parents do it, but the marriage is the most intimate human bond there is. It's between the man, the woman, and God. It's a beautiful picture. And he wants to keep that that way. He wants to keep that between man, woman, and God. In uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul said this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God, what we're reading of in Nehemiah, with idols? What agreement is there? For we, Christians, are the living temple of God. Now, I'll tell you what. Many of you know my testimony. This is a hard teaching for me. I thank the Lord my God that my wife did not go to a good Bible teaching church. Otherwise, she would have never been the wife, you know, my wife. I praise God for that. But you know what? I'm being selfish because those first 20 years, listen up, ladies, in case you think you're going to get someone and save them just because he's good looking or personable or has a good job. Listen up. Those first 20 years were not easy for my wife. It's especially for her faith. Because her faith was divided between Jesus and me. And it should not be that way. It wasn't fair to her. And I thank God that he was patient and that she was patient and that eventually he saved me. But... This is the thing. God is really clear. We cannot serve two masters. You know, not only did my wife suffer, but my children suffered. Because she would take them to church and they'd be hearing about this Christian God and they come home and dad's reading some new age book. Hey, there are many ways to God. Sorry, God. But again, he's clear. We can't serve two masters. They could not, Israel's history proves, they could not worship both Yahweh and Molech. 
They could not claim God and Marduk. And we cannot follow Christ and at the same time be married to someone who says Muhammad is the prophet. It just won't work. So I love in this resolution, they didn't dance around the issue. They owned it. They realized that Solomon, the greatest king of Israel, that built the beautiful palace and the beautiful temple, he led them astray, didn't he? He had wives that were idol worshipers. It didn't work for him, and it certainly wouldn't work for them. So they just said, boom, right off the bat, we will not give our children or take for our sons people of the lands. Marriage is hard enough, and without Jesus at the center, it's almost impossible, especially in our culture and our world today. So that's where they began. So they tackled the biggest problem first, and what was the second one they tackled? Verse 31, and if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath day or on the holy day. Again, people of the lands, the pagans. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about how all of this coincided with the festival of booths, and I used the example of, um, what was, who, who did I use? Was it Ishmael? Who was the guy, who was my Arab guy? That I, does anybody name, because I used one guy with, a, with an authentic sounding name and the other guy was Bob, remember? But anyway, it doesn't matter. But you remember those people, these are the traders. These are the people coming from all over the lands, from the different cultures, selling their wares. And they had, they had kind of fallen apostate and they let the people come in on the Sabbath day and they were trading and selling with them. And they said, we're going to stop doing this. Hmm, that's interesting. Let me tell you a little bit of not that ancient American history. Well, you guys, the younger people think it's ancient because it's coming from me, but it's really not that ancient. It was not that long ago, here in America even, that on our day of Sabbath, because this was mostly a Christian nation, on Sunday you pretty much couldn't buy anything except for gasoline because most of the stores were closed. It was just realized that people would go to church on Sundays. I was talking to Jan with it, about it and I thought that most of the malls had been closed. I know a lot of grocery stores were closed, at least when I was growing up. And she said, yeah, she worked for a, a, one of the bigger department stores in the mall and on Sunday you got time and a half because they realized that it was a special day for you to come in and work on what should have been a day of rest. So it wasn't that long ago in our culture, in this place, that we used to realize that it was important, A, that we take a day off to worship our God, and B, that we needed a day off physically to rest from work as God commanded us. So we needed it for both physical recuperation and for spiritual recuperation and renewal. The Sabbath is God's way of spending time with his people. Now, it seems like, especially given that this is their second resolution of what we will no longer do, that it seems to me that it's really hard for us as human beings to spend quality time with our God and worship him and be continually in prayer with him and go shopping for shoes at the same time. Or to go to Best Buy and look at the latest tech devices, whatever it is that diverts your attention from God. I'm guilty of this too. You know, all you have to, you don't even have to go anywhere anymore. You got Amazon right on your computer and you can go, oh, I need this, I need that. All right, but the fact is, is it's distracting from the Lord our God. And this was the second resolution, second part of the resolution we see. They said, look, we're not going to let these business in, businessmen in our gates anymore. We're not going to do this commercial trade. We're going to close the doors, the gates to the city, and we will worship our God on that day. The third thing we see. Next verse, actually finishing that verse. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year 
and the exaction of every depth. Now I almost, I almost missed this point as I was studying for this because it's kind of a, a strange thing to throw in there. It's like, A, we're not gonna, we're not gonna marry our kids to people that are unbelievers. B, we're not gonna do anything on the day of worship except worship God. And oh, by the way, we're not gonna, we're not gonna harvest our crops in the seven year and take extraction for debt. And I'm like, what? Wait, what? And then I kind of thought about it and prayed about it. And I said, what's he talking about here? Why, is he talk why are they talking about foregoing crops and expecting to be paid back very quickly? Now, I think in order to answer this, we really need to think back on what we've been studying in the whole book of Nehemiah. Remember this overarching theme that God is faithful to his people and he's been merciful and forgiving throughout the whole thing. God's been faithful to an ungrateful and stiff-necked people. The book of Nehemiah begins with what? A report that Jerusalem is in dire straits. It's a mess and the people are a mess. So what happens? God chooses a God-fearing man who's also a great administrator. He gifts him. He, oh, by the way, puts him in a position to go to the king of the pagan nation and say, oh my God, you know, our, our, our homeland is in a mess. And the king says, hey, you want to go rebuild it? Oh, well, yeah. Okay, how about I, I pay for rebuilding your, your wall and I build your house and, and, and give you letters of protection. Okay. He goes, and then they rebuild the wall in 52 days, and all their enemies are kept away, no matter how much they threaten them. And now they're in this new city, and they've realized, wow, we've had blessing upon blessing upon blessing, and what did we do to deserve this? Nothing. God forgave them. <coughs> Ezra came with the word, they open God's word, and they see everything. They experience God's unmerited love and favor. And I think that's why this line, this verse is so high in this laundry list of what they're going to do. Because they realize that. And so what does God say? God says, have compassion on those who have less, right? Why were the fields to lay fallow the seventh year? so that the poor people could come in and glean and have crops and food for themselves. Why the forgiveness of debts? What had we seen them dealing with earlier? That while the people were working on the wall, some of the Jews were oppressing their own people and enslaving them. And Nehemiah said, this is wrong. We got to stop this. And so they say, we're going to pledge to quit extracting these debts from our people. Forgiveness and love. Unmerited favor and grace. This is the first thing God showers upon his people. And it really should be the first outflowing from us as we realize all that he's done for us. I hope I'm able to be this way at times. I know I fail miserably. There are times where, you know, you get in the moment of uh, uh, the situation and you, you get heated and you get angry at people and you fail to show that same unmerited favor and grace that God showed us. But we need to remember that. That needs to be at the very top of our list of how we deal with others. It's interesting, but maybe it'd help us to remember to put crops and debt forgiveness at the top of our minds. What's the next thing we see? So we, so far we've seen the resolution of the people to separate from idolatry, from the culture, to love as God has loved them. And now, in the rest of these verses from 32 through um, 39, it's a lot, we're going to read it, we see that the people now are making a firm commitment to support God's church, his church people, and God's work. Verse 32, we also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. 
for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all of the work of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people, have likewise cast lots for the wood offering. By the way, I want to notice, I want you to notice here, that just because people are doing God's work, the priests, the Levites, they are not exempted for having to serve the Lord their God and tithe also. Okay, that's all part of that. So, they're entering into it too. To bring it into the house of our God, according to our Father's houses, at the appointed times, year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree, year by year, to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough, and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil, to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe, to the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers, where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister, and the gatekeepers, and the singers. We will not... Neglect the house of our God. We will not neglect the house of our God. Now, we could go through this verse by verse and line by line. And those of you that are already starting to fall asleep will be snoring by the time I got through it. So we're not going to do that. All right. But we are going to break down the symbolism of all this and what's the point of all these offerings. I don't want us to miss the big picture here because there is a big picture that's being painted. What's the big picture we can glean from these seven verses with all the different offerings mentioned in them? Well, here's the big picture as far as I think we can boil it down is that we have these points that come from this, that everything good comes from God. Everybody agree with that? Everything good comes from God. The second point is all that I have comes from God. Well, if everything good that comes from God and all that I have comes from God, then in reality, nothing I have is mine. Nothing I have is mine. All that I have is God's. So let's break that down. Everything good comes from God. I think we can all agree on that. Does everybody agree with that? I hope everybody agrees with that. Amen? Everything good comes from God, right? Now, that's, I think, the heart of this resolution of all that they've talked about here. God's acts of restoration, provision, his love for his people were clearly manifested in what they saw around them and what he had done in restoring the wall and rebuilding the wall and restoring Jerusalem and, and bringing his priests to read the word and their renew, renew, rejuvenated prayer life. All these things, they came face to face with the fact, and listen here, because I hope all of us have come face to face with the same thing, that they did not deserve the abundance of blessings that they were now enjoying. I think those of you that went to India came, came pretty close, saw that close up and personally, didn't you? When you saw how much we've been blessed with here and how much we have in comparison with what our brothers and sisters have in India, that came, it, the first time I went there, that came crashing down on me. But that's true for all of God's believers. It doesn't matter if you're living in a mansion or in a mud hut. The fact that he's redeemed us and blessed us means that we've received much more than we ever deserved. 
And that realization leads to the following conclusion then, that all that we have comes from God. Now, let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever really worked really, really hard to achieve something? It could be anything, all right? Did you ever have a class that you really wanted to excel in? Or maybe you wanted to, so, so many of you are so gifted musically, you really wanted to master a piece on an instrument? Or I know there are people that love to cook. You wanted to master a recipe so that it was just better than anything anyone else had ever eaten, right? My point is that you may have tried what you did, you spent hours, days, maybe months, even years mastering this thing so that when you finally performed that piece or you spoke before somebody or you, you served that dinner, people were just, ah, oh, this is wonderful. I've never seen or heard or tasted something so magnificent. You did the very best you could do. And when it was accomplished, the people were impressed probably gave you compliments. Or maybe you got an A++++ plus 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 or something. Or, or you got a raise at work. It was a neat thing. You really did it, right? How did that make you feel? I hope it made you feel good. I mean, we, we do have a part in this, right? We, we work hard for that. Satisfied? Yeah? Maybe a little bit proud? Okay, we, we tend to do that, right? So let me ask you another question then. How were you able to accomplish this? How were you able to accomplish this? Was it because of your hard work? Because of dedication, perseverance, studying, trying to do it over and over again, thought, self-discipline, all of the above? Is that how you were able to do it? It's not a trick question. Yes? Yeah? Eh. Yeah, that's partially right. That's partially true. But the real reason that any of us are able to accomplish anything is that it's God Almighty that gave us the ability to accomplish these things. We certainly had our part. Because if you hadn't spent that time being disciplined, studying, practicing, all these things, then it wouldn't have been done. So we would have failed on our part too. But it was God that gave us every one of those abilities, whether it's playing a masterpiece on a, on a violin, or flying an airplane, or being a physician, any of these things, they're all gifts from our Lord God, right? That they're the only reason we have these abilities is because he gave them to us. And if this is true, and I really believe it is, then just like Nehemiah and the people here, we need to realize that all we have, whether it's a magnificently rebuilt wall miraculously done in 52 days, or a nice home, or a really neat, cool car out there, whatever it is, it all came from God. It was because of his giving us this ability. And that leads us to that third point. The realization that the people here in Nehemiah came to, that everything we have, or in other words, nothing that we have, is ours. Nothing I have is mine. It's all been a gift from the Lord God. It's really a truth here. It's a simple statement. And I hope that as Christians, it's one that we can all embrace and agree with. Everything comes from God, right? And if it comes from Him, do we agree with that? Everything good comes from God, right? Yeah. But that's not the same thing as saying that nothing I have is God's, is it? Or nothing that I have is mine, rather. I misspoke, I'm sorry. It tells you where my heart is, right? <laughs> It's easy for us to say all good things come from God. It's harder to say nothing I have is mine, which is really what the people were saying here, and then pledging to give the best of what they had, the first fruits, to God, 
to honor him and his house so that God's work can go forward. They put a pledge in there, in writing. Jesus dealt with this in the story of the rich young ruler. And I think it's really significant that we find this in three of the Gospels. It's in Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18. I think it's significant that that same story is in there three times. Because what was the problem with the rich young ruler? It wasn't that he loved God, that he didn't love Jesus. But he thought all that he had was his. And so when Jesus told him, go and sell it all and give it to the poor, he's like, but it's mine. It's mine. I don't want to take all my stuff and give it to him. When my kids were growing up, there was this Disney movie that was kind of popular for a while, and I think it maybe still is popular. It's called Finding Nemo. Have any of you seen Finding Nemo? Okay. And I, I don't know about the other one, but I know, I know this part of Finding Nemo, not that I watched the movie, but because my kids in the back seat, as they were fighting over things, would mimic these seagull characters in Finding Nemo. And what would these seagull characters say? Every time they saw something they wanted, would they say, mine, 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 mine. You know, and we laugh about that, but you know, cartoon characters a lot of times are just parodies of human beings, right? They really are just, they just kind of personify how we really are as people. And, you know, if we, have, if we ever watch little children starting to play with others for the first time, what do we have to teach them? We have to teach them to share, right? Because their inclination is to say, mine, mine, mine. The rich young, the rich young ruler said, mine, mine, mine. And Nehemiah and the people realized as they were writing this resolution that as a pledge to the Lord their God, swearing they're going to support their house, his house, that what they had was not mine. So they gratefully pledged to support the people, the temple, the priests, the house. They pledged to support God's work by tithing so that the priests and the ministers could go out and do the work of evangelism. They said, we will not neglect the house of our God. They put it in writing. And then they said, we enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. I don't know about you, but I found this very convicting. I found this very convicting. All right? Jan and I are faithful to tithe, but you know what? We've never really sat down, kind of like I was talking about at the beginning, to commit to, the God, to our God in writing what we will give. We've budgeted it. We've done all that budgeting stuff. We've given sacrificially even. Ask about when my wife didn't get to go to Israel. <laughs> I'll let her share that story with you. But I've never committed before God and said that every time we're blessed, we will give this first, the first fruits. And that's what we're say they're saying here is we will give our first fruits, the best. Because it's not ours, it's his. And that's how his kingdom goes forward when we realize that. And we freely give out of a loving and grateful heart to do his work, to accomplish his mission on, uh, in this world. So... Is this, is this a descriptive verse or a prescriptive one? Remember the difference. One describes an action, another one prescribes how we should act. I think it's a little of both. I think it describes both the change of their heart and the Lord wants us to have that change of heart so that we will do the same type of thing. 
What would be the positive result of doing something like that? I think there'd be a twofold benefit here. First, I think that in order to make a pledge like this, you really have to come to grips. You really have to own that nothing I have is mine, that it all belongs to God. You really have to come to grips with that. And then the second benefit of that is that if we make a contract with God, just like when we sign that contract to pay back to loan the house, we have this formal agreement between us and God. It becomes much more serious in our minds because we've, we've signed our name to this and said, Jesus, I will do this. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this, but I'm saying, I'm suggesting that this is a good thing. And that's what we're seeing here tonight. So, amazingly, we're done with Nehemiah 10. A whole chapter in one night. It's almost a record for me, I know. But what did we learn tonight? Well, we saw people in their resolution. They made a radical resolution before God. They were, they were tra being transformed as we should all be transformed daily. And they made a radical resolution. And they, they resolved to separate themselves from idolatry. We could all do that. We may, we may not have people next door with, with shrines in their house, with weird looking rocks that they worship. The India team knows what I'm talking about. But you know what we do have next door to our house? We have the mall. Or we have in our house the internet and all these tempting things. I'm sure every one of us has some sort of idol in our lives. Okay? They resolve to separate themselves from cultural influences. This is a hard one. Because we're immersed in the culture here. All you got to do is turn on the TV. Blah, 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 blah. It's trying to show you something. It's trying to show you how you should behave. If you're still in school... The public schools especially, they're trying to reprogram you. Trying to tell you that you have to decide whether you're male or female. Whether you should male, marry someone that's male or female. They're trying to tell you that, oh, morals don't really matter. Our culture is trying to inculcate us into its beliefs every day. What does light have to do with darkness? They resolve to love as God has loved them, and God loves us. This is a big one for me. I tend to get judgmental. I tend to go, wow, why don't you do this? You know, and like, but that's not our Lord. Our Lord is loving. He's merciful. He tells us to forgive 749 times, and probably past that. It's kind of a joke. And they resolved to support God's work, his church. So I don't know about you. Most of you didn't make New Year's resolutions this year. But it seems to me, in reading Nehemiah 10, that God gave us a pretty good New Year's resolution to enter into with him this year. I'll leave that up to you and your prayer time with him. But it just seems to me that he's given us a really good thing that, that we can do this year. It's something that every Christian should really be able to embrace. And guess what? Unlike the people that we read of in the book of Nehemiah, who we know will fail to keep this resolution, we know by the condition of Jerusalem when Jesus went there, but guess what, Christian? We have Holy Spirit, don't we? He's living in us. And if we seek him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, this resolution will be easy for us to keep. So, there we have it. Nehemiah 10. Father God, we just... Um, we thank you for how amazing you are. Jesus, only you could orchestrate us falling into this chapter of, the, of your book to study tonight. Only you could orchestrate the fact that 
that we had a team go to India to see a culture that so much reflected what we read about here for the pagan people in this book, Lord, and it brings this alive to us, Lord God. Only you, Lord God, could call each and every one of us out of the darkness and into your marvelous light and knit us together as a family, as your children at your feet, Lord God. Lord, I just pray that for every one of us, as this new year progresses, Lord God, that every day, even every hour, every minute, Lord, that our thoughts would be filled continually with your love, your grace, and mercy. And Lord, that the, the transformation that you work in us would be one of just being a people that are transformed by you, that we would just overflow with those that don't know you and show your love and grace and mercy to them. Lord, that we would love as you've loved us. And Lord, that we would do everything we can to support your work to go forward in this world that needs you so desperately. Jesus, we just pray for a great revival. Lord God, that we would just be filled to the brim in this house with people that are hungry and thirsty to know your word, to serve you, and to bring glory to you. And Lord, we pray all these things for your glory, Jesus. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen.